Thank you all for joining us uh, for this important uh, webinar on embracing change, a shift in steatotic liver disease, SLD nomenclature, uh, from NAFLD to MASLD. Um, I am Dr. Naeem al Quiri, the Chief Medical Officer and Director of the SLD program at Arizona Liver Health in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I am joined today by my uh, two co-moderators, Dr. Jon Schadenberg, a professor of medicine and director of the Metabolic Liver Research Program at the University Medical Center Mainz, Germany, and Dr. Niam Ha, who is a transplant hepatology fellow at UCSF uh, Medical Center. Uh, we have a great panel of expert speakers today, and we hope to have an interactive uh, session. Uh, Dr. Mary Ranella, Professor of Medicine at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine, uh, Director of the Metabolic uh, Liver Program, will start by introducing the rationale for the nomenclature change. Uh, Dr. Jeff Lazarus, Professor of Global Health at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health, um, and the head of the Health Systems Research Group at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health will discuss the Im implementation of the new nomenclature for epidemiology and patients' outcomes uh, research. And finally, uh, Dr. J.P. Arab, Associate Professor of Medicine at the Division of Gastroenterology and the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Western University in London, Ontario, will describe the overlapping features of MASLD and ALD and help us better understand the new entity of uh, MET-ALD. At the end of the presentations, we will have a Q&A session, and we expect the attendees to submit many questions uh, through the Q&A feature. Uh, with this, I will hand it now to Dr. Mary Renella to get it started. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naeem. So first, let me just start by sharing my screen. Okay, so um, I thought I'd start with some historical context that basically this is uh, this disease actually has been, um, you know, evolving over time. In fact, in 1980, uh, when the term NASH was originally coined by Jürgen Ludwig, um, he had a very difficult time publishing this paper. In fact, he tried multiple journals and ended up publishing it in the Mayo Clinic uh, proceedings. Um, certainly not his first choice, but he was the first person to identify the entity of steatohepatitis. It looked like alcohol, but wasn't alcohol. And then about 20 years later, um, we had our first uh, meeting on uh, our single topic conference on NAFLD, and we discussed multiple alternative names, but we couldn't really settle on any particular name. And then again, 20 years later, um, a uh, uh, Mohammed Eslam, Jacob George, uh, and Arun actually published a paper proposing uh, a new nomenclature on called metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease. And this really had a lot of important attributes. It, it gave an affirmative diagnosis. It removed the po potential stigma of using the word alcohol or referring to alcohol. Um, and it recognized the close relationship with other metabolic disorders. And so this really, I thought was, was reasonable. Um, the issue though, was that it also um, eliminated the importance of steatohepatitis in the definition and, and allowed a more liberal use of alcohol within it, meaning that people who drink a fair amount of alcohol would still be considered uh, in this uh, in this disease category. So there were issues raised uh, by this, uh, and many of us felt that it was something that needed to be studied and more broadly uh, undertaken, and there, uh, particularly to look at the effect of stigma uh, and disease awareness, uh, drug and biomarker development, uh, impact of alcohol, and, and other uh, things. Several editorials uh, were written, and for that, from that point, we decided to embark on a multi-society effort to uh, reconsider uh, the name of the disease. So this effort was primarily led by ASLD and EASL, uh, and then in very close collaboration with ALE. Um, and as far as the key attributes of a Delphi process, it needs to be informed by subject matter experts. There needs to be anonymity of voting and reporting of results, and there needs to be transparency. Uh, survey rounds need to be combined with in-person discussion, and this is important because um, this is the, the most effective way to engage people of diverse opinions um, and, and come to uh, a place of uh, consensus, ideally. Um, it does hopefully uh, assure that as many viewpoints are considered as possible. So within this process, 
we had 264 nominees that were nominated by their respective societies uh, proportional to the association member size. And we had 56 countries represented in this group. Our steering committee was clearly a group of experts uh, in the field. And um, you know we tried to capture a, as many uh, um, geographic areas as possible as, as well as other uh, diversity and inclu included patient advocates as well. So to overview the process, I will not go through this in detail because it was a quite a lengthy process. It took almost three years. Um, importantly, we, deter we determined that a priority, the, the threshold for consensus would be a supermajority, uh, so 67% or more. Um, four rounds of questions were undertaken, and you can see that in aggregate, uh, you know, more than uh, 2,500 uh, comments uh, were addressed and used to then further adapt the subsequent round of questions. Jumping to just the high level results of what we came uh, up with per round, if for in the first round, we determined that a uh, name change was indeed uh, desirable. Uh, there were several aspects regarding the definition uh, that needed to be addressed. And that was name, most importantly, that moderate alcohol or excessive alcohol beyond what, what is limited by the NAFL diagnosis. Um, in that context of NAFL needed to be a separate subgroup and that steatohepatitis was critical to retain because it's the driver of disease progression. In round two, uh, we determined that an overarching term was beneficial, largely because it would be able to encompass evolving uh, knowledge uh, in the field uh, and uh, facilitate the development of uh, phenotypes. Um, in, in, in addition to alcohol being stigmatizing, about 66% of respondents thought that fatty was stigmatizing as well, and we can touch on this in the question and answer uh, period as well. Um, within this under this, this term of SLD, uh, we came up with, uh, there were three acronym choices that were 30% uh, each, so then an independent subcommittee took those uh, and uh, determined what the final acronym would be. And then for, with respect to definition, a majority felt the definition needed to change in uh, concomitantly with the change in the nomenclature, um, that it should include metabolic parameters. Uh, and then there would be a precise, then a precise um, definition was derived for both adults and pediatrics with this independent subcommittee. So the requirements that we, uh, gave to the independent subcommittee is that our, based on our uh, results were that the um, nomenclature convey underlying disease driver, that it, it is a non-stigmatizing term. Again, we gave them the top three, which uh, met those criteria. We need to account for the role of alcohol and the ability to parse out other etiologies. Again, part of the other reason why an umbrella term was useful. And again, adapt to advances in the field that I just mentioned. Um, with respect to alcohol, um, JP is going to talk about this uh, in, in detail, so I'm not going to uh, belabor the point other than it was important to address it because it could have significant impact on response to therapeutics and um, thresholds uh, that have been studied uh, and are evolving and emerging from uh, biomarker uh, studies and databases. So the consensus nomenclature was that ste uh, steatotic liver disease would be the overarching term that the uh, equivalent term for NAFLD would now be MASLD or metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease. Um, within that metabolic dysfunction associated steatohepatitis or MASH would replace NASH. And uh, we, we did not specifically address this in the nomenclature um, paper itself, but uh, it, it's been um, you know, raised on several occasions now that the equivalency for NAFL should probably be uh, MASL, uh, as you can see here. Um, this category of overlap, uh, which we called MET-ALD, is meant to encompass people who drink more alcohol than is allowed within the NAFL diagnosis. And remember that we were not, we did not feel that it was appropriate to deviate from the thresholds that were pr uh, previously set for this uh, when defining MASL, because it would then change the natural history uh, of what we knew uh, thus far. And that was a very important uh, tenant that we felt we needed to stick by. So this overlap category takes people who are over that 20 uh, score, uh, slash 30 for females and males up to 50 slash 60, uh, which is a significant amount of alcohol intake. Um, so that would be MET-ALD. 
and JP again will speak to this uh, more. And then other things in the differential diagnosis uh, causing hepatic steatosis are noted over uh, to the right. So with respect to the revised definition, again, we wanted this to be an affirmative set of diagnostic criteria. Uh, we had near universal agreement on erring on the side of being inclusive. Again, this is important because this then uh, will allow us to use previous uh, natural hist history data and uh, therapeutic uh, data. Uh, the uh, additionally to uh, at least to the extent possible minimize patient heterogeneity and be adaptable to future insights. Uh, it, it needed to be we wanted it to be simple, reliable, and easily measurable uh, across practice settings. Um, and the cardiometabolic criteria that would be part of this definition needed to be established and validated in other metabolic health disorders. So these were based uh, on. Um, well-accepted criteria. And then again, the, the pediatric criteria were derived uh, after the adult criteria were, were created. So what we have here is, uh, our, our, is a flow chart um, that you can find in the paper, which will be published in final form. Um, in, in Actually, it's published now in final form. Um, as of two days ago, you can see the criteria are basically one of five, and these are based on Alberti's circulation paper uh, outlining the cardiometabolic uh, risk factors. And you can see it's intentionally actually uh, quite broad in order to be able to overlap as much as possible with the uh, NAFLD population. So this has been endorsed by more than 70 societies. Um, importantly, uh, the FDA uh, has, although not officially in writing, uh, released a statement. They do uh, consider these terms to be equivalent. And here is a screenshot from the FDA biomarker workshop uh, at the outset of the meeting. Uh, George Makar uh, set forth the uh, nomenclature uh, equivalencies that you can see on the slide of Mazeld to Na uh, NAFL to Mazeld and NASH to MASH. We've been lucky to have a very broad implementation, actually, and now the webpage, ASLD webpage, is now translated into Spanish, French, Portuguese, and we're working on uh, Mandarin uh, and Arabic. Um, you can see that it's been really uh, broadly uh, taken up in uh, on a broad uh, international level and multiple smaller uh, meetings as well that don't fit on this slide. So there are multiple implementation or implications of nomenclature change uh, with respect to clinical care, uh, impact on existing uh, data, disease awareness in patients, and of course, biomarker and drug development. So firstly, I just wanna to touch briefly on the overlap between NAFLD and MASL. This is something that was very important to us because we did not want to uh, discount uh, previously published data. So um, this is one now of several papers showing that if you move over uh, to the right, if you look at a community-based cohort, an incident NAFL cohort, and biopsy-proven cohort, all from Hong Kong, you can see that the vast majority are actually going to meet the criteria for Mazeld, around 98%. And in several other databases, um, at least three of which are uh, very soon to be published, the overlap is somewhere between 97 and 99% overlap with Mazeld uh, and NAFLD. With respect to biomarker populations, these are data from Vlad uh, Ratio and Jerome Boursier uh, in a French uh, biomarker cohort. And you can see that uh, the overlap was quite substantial in this uh, data set, 98.4% uh, of those who had uh, the cardiometabolic uh, criteria available for uh, review. So there are, of course, um, you know, barriers to effective care even before the nomenclature change. And I think that we can broadly categorize them into patient-related barriers and provider-related barriers. And starting with patients, low disease awareness, uh, disparities in access to care and disease stigma, I think were important uh, uh, issues for patients. For providers, um, there's really a lack of perceived uh, treatment options, even though we do have uh, therapeutic approaches that are um, you know, definitely implementable, uh, even now before we have approved therapeutics. Um, a lack of knowledge of understanding how to identify at-risk patients um, and the, the fact that you can have advanced disease in the setting of normal labs, I think is something that's difficult for providers to uh, sort of uh, get their wrap their arms around. Um, and again, nonspecific uh, symptom profile, which is of course a barrier uh, for both patients and providers. Um, 
the advantages to this uh, nomenclature that it uses non-stigmatizing language, allows for more seamless discussion of root causes, and it offers a diagnostic category for those with more than minimal alcohol use. Uh, the disadvantages are, of course, the medicalization of the lexicon and lack less familiarity with new terms. Um, we've uh, engaged in several activities, uh, this one being one of them, to help uh, sort of soften uh, and, and get people accustomed to using the new nomenclature and, of course, ongoing conversations with patients and advocacy groups as well. Um, we've done a fair amount and there's much left to do with respect to medical education, use in publications and use in practice, and then with respect to uh, the implementation uh, across the uh, therapeutic landscape, again, working with regulators uh, to, to help this and, and pharma as well. And then importantly, uh, and with and an ongoing process is to uh, continue to engage uh, with uh, regulatory uh, bodies nationally and globally to try and um, alter the billing code so that this is then uh, something that can be uh, billed for and uh, easier to implement from that perspective. So to summarize, um, MASL uh, defined population has about 98-99% overlap with NAFLD. Uh, MASH is exactly defined the same as NASH. Uh, there's been excellent uptake so far, although we have a lot of efforts ongoing, including to incorporate into ICD coding and MET ALD, which I think offers a, a, a nice uh, opportunity for uh, research, which again, Dr. Arab will uh, be getting to. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the many people in this process uh, who you can see uh, here listed, uh, who really did a uh, tremendous job in making this uh, move forward. So I'm going to stop there and I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Professor Lazarus, who's gonna talk to us about implementation uh, of the nomenclature. So I'm going to speak as Dr. Manella mentioned about really trying to start to navigate the change in the field. So she set out very clearly you know, the background, what led to the name change, where we are now with the name change culminating with, you know, FDA recognition of the name change, um, starting to grow the awareness within the field and even thinking about practical operational aspects like, like billing um, and also covered some of the epidemiology. I'll um, try and look at, you know, where do we go? where do we go next? So when we think about the nomenclature, it was already mentioned, you know, the issues around patients, but for those on, on you know, on, on this webinar, the medical experts, the clinicians, we need to remember that now we have, you know, increased accuracy and precision, clear defining characteristics, and this needs to start to lead to how we can refine our clinical care pathways, and importantly, it's, it's a real charge to have multidisciplinary um, models of care. Easier said than done, but you know when we're talking about metabolic dysfunction associated SLD, we really need to take account um, of all of those um, criteria. I'll briefly talk about the importance of reaching policymakers to make sure policies um, are in place and there's awareness across a broad range of stakeholders and the societal um, perceptions which are, are so important. The liver is a very stigmatized um, organ and this is a very stigmatized um, disease. We're starting to overcome that with the change um, in name, but I think there's still a, a long way um, to go. So it's important to remember that as important as we think um, MASLD and MASH are, um, it's really not important for most people in society. Most people have not heard about it. Most policymakers are not aware. And when we look at the situation, even in related fields, endocrinology, obesity, cardiology, but also primary care, we see um, relatively little attention given to, um, to this condition. So we need unity in our field so that we can really raise um, awareness and about um, this disease and, and the new name and what it implies so we can reach um, the large numbers of people who are undiagnosed and make sure they're linked to the care um, they need. So now we're really at a stage of trying to disseminate information about this. First and foremost to, to medical societies and Dr. Ranella mentioned the ongoing um, endorsement process, publications in, in journals that aren't just focused on liver disease, reaching out to regulators, both the FDA in the US, but also the EMA and national 
regulators in, in other countries and we're engaging um, with industry. There's an ongoing survey now that, that Hannes Hagstrom is leading on ICD recommendations. Um, there is regular engagement uh, with industry. So we start to understand um, how this will impact um, ongoing trials and efforts. And we, the FDA workshop was mentioned, but we've also, and I'll come back to this at the end, started to engage with the World Health Organization because at this time, WHO is giving basically no attention to MASLD, MASH, or previously NAFLD, NASH um, at all. And that really needs to change, particularly for those countries that very closely follow um, the WHO guidance. So we know the global MASLD prevalence is rising. I just raised this uh, or present this here to remind you that we can really use NAFLD and MASLD um, interchangeably based on the studies, the Song, Ratsio, and other studies that um, Maru presented. It's also important to, to really um, further develop the prevalence studies, understand the prevalence in different populations. We know it's very high in people with type 2 diabetes. Here we found that it was the same, more than one in three adults um, and people living with HIV. And we'll need to do this across populations and in sub-national entities, looking at states, cities, particular hospitals and, and catchment areas. Um, there's a high risk group of factors um, uh, for MASLD and mass, uh, mass uh, progression. So I won't go through all of them now, but it's important um, that when we're engaging with others um, outside the field on um, MASLD, that we remind them that there are lifestyle issues, there's commercial uh, determinant issues, that it's not just obesity and diabetes, um, but there's also uh, genetic modifiers, older age, male sex, iron overload, um, and so on. And all of this means practically that you know, for mass LD, we'll need a minimal set of metabolic assessments, which everyone should be aware of. And you have the new ASLD guidelines, further workup for cardiovascular disease and other conditions as appropriate. But where we need to make bigger changes is in the fields of obesity management and diabetes, where we do need them to have a workup for mass LD and liver fibrosis as appropriate. And if cirrhosis, there'll also be a, a benefit from screening for, for liver cancer. We often hear that, and Maru mentioned this, that there's there's a perceived uh, lack of treatment. There's a lot we can do. There are lifestyle interventions. They are challenging, but we do need to address them. And it's not enough just to tell people to lose weight or exercise. We need to think about um, the conditions they live in and if that will be possible and really how much weight they need to lose and how much the uh, physical activity they need. There are metabolic drugs. There's also um, bariatric surgery. And of course, we'll, we're well aware that there are treatments um, in the pipeline. Um, you know, to address um, the lifestyle interventions, um, particularly around nutrition, I just wanted to share these concepts of social prescribing, which is linking individuals with suitable non-medical resources um, to enhance their well-being and social nutrition, you know, looking at how the social factors um, influence diet, what, when, how, and why individuals eat, the likelihood of developing non-communicable diseases. So for clinicians, this means that you can be thinking about not just medical treatment, but also social support networks like we find in other fields, whether it's cancer, HIV, diabetes, or so many other conditions, um, dietary acculturation, um, you know, what do people, what do your patients typically eat, what substitute foods um, are there and how can we make sure that um, we're understanding their reality, their context, and what impacts what they eat um, so that we can actually make the dietary changes that you're also um, prescribing. This means we need to go a bit beyond the, the liver gut um, focus and think about who else will we um, engage. This is metabolic dysfunction associated. So we are gonna to need to engage with endocrinology, obesity medicine, but also primary care, nutritionists, cardiologists, behavioral psychologists. You're probably all familiar with many of the mental health challenges that patients um, face, um, those who are obese, those who have multi-morbidity um, or other issues, and that will all affect mm -hmm. um, their ability to, um, to implement the, the recommendations that treatment and care that you're uh, prescribing, how we better engage with allied um, health professionals as well, because this will be too much just to handle uh, from the hepatology um, clinic. 
That means we need to go from a disease-centered care approach with a focus on the liver to more of a people-centered care approach where we focus on comorbidities and health-related um, quality of life. The optimal care model starts to look something like this with the patient in the center. Most patients will be seen in primary care. Large numbers will have diabetes type 2. They'll be seen in endocrinology. All will need nutritional lifestyle interventions. Some will need to see health psychologists. You'll have the role of the gastroenterologist and the hepatologist um, for therapies and for those with advanced um, fibrosis. And then you'll have a role of um, the cardiologist. So we need to think, how are we actually going to engage this? It can look nice on a slide, but what does it mean when we start to operationalize this? When we looked at what's being operationalized a few, just a few years ago um, in the published literature, and we found very few studies um, publishing the models of care they're using. Um, what we tried to do was come up with a set of recommendations around the what, where, who, and how of an optimal model of care. One of the main findings was the importance of establishing systems for coordinating and integrating care across um, the health uh, care system, but also a focus on non-invasive tests. Far, far too many people are not diagnosed, and this is a particular problem in those already with um, advanced fibrosis. So we need to look at how we can um, reach people earlier and how we can, well, you know, uh, risk stratify in the best um, manner possible. If we're going to move towards NITs and ultimately replace the liver biopsy, we need to make sure um, that there's not variation in the cutoffs being used. In this small study of 35 survey respondents, 14 different NITs were used, and FIB4 and, and TE were the most common. And while that may not be a problem having so many different NITs, what we found was that the cutoffs used for the same NITs for mast cell D-risk stratification vary between clinicians. So it's important to um, look at the guidelines that are in place and make sure we're all using the same cutoffs because ultimately we may be relying on this to make um, treatment um, decisions. Another development on the way, and I won't really go into this, but there will be potential um, AI um, applications in liver disease in general and at the routine clinical laboratory level, hopefully we'll start to be able to make predictions of fibrosis, predictions of cirrhosis complications and mortality, which should really be a game changer um, in, this, in this field. There's a range of apps um, that are being used, very common in obesity and diabetes, and these can be helpful um, in our field too, and we'll need more um, liver health specific and mast cell D and MASH specific um, apps. Now, the economic impact is, is enormous. I won't go through these numbers, but you're seeing numbers of hundreds of millions, of tens of billions of dollars in direct medical costs and in societal costs due to loss of quality adjusted life years for NAFLD. So we need to be thinking, what does that mean um, at our level? What does it mean at our hospitals and our clinics? We can start to develop an investment framework, and I'll just draw your attention to um, the bottom left, where we can start to think about what is the return on investment? How will um, the large costs of, and, uh, of both not addressing NAFLD, but also addressing NAFLD, affect um, healthcare system budgets, host individual hospital budgets. There'll be expenses in the beginning, but we think there'll be a great payoff both economically in addition, obviously, to health outcomes in the longer run. We'll be needing this at national levels. We'll also be needing it at sub-national levels, an investment framework similar to what was done in hepatitis C, HIV, and other fields that can really get policymakers and decision makers on board to understand um, what needs to be done, what needs to be purchased, and what they can expect um, in, in return. Now, we'll all be familiar that um, often the poorest, lowest resource um, patients have the most trouble adhering to um, the lifestyle treatment and care um, that's prescribed to them. And we know that lower SES is associated with higher NAFLD prevalence, higher MASH prevalence, and have, these people have higher liver cancer rates. So again, this goes back to the concepts of social prescribing, social nutrition, to think of the social context um, individuals belong into, and we can't treat everyone equally. And as mentioned, you know, liver is such a stigmatized um, organ. This is such a stigmatized 
condition, MASLD, and MASH, we need to understand that there are different kinds of stigma. This comes from the Easel Lancet Commission, where we looked at public stigma, structural stigma, but also stigma in the healthcare setting, some of which we hope to overcome um, through the new nomenclature. All of that can contribute to self-stigma, um, and the problem of self-stigma is, is it's been shown to lead to care avoidance and delayed care, an increase in the number of people with severe liver diseases, an increase in unhealthy behaviors, and an increase ultimately in, in health and social um, inequalities. Now, I mentioned at the beginning, patient reported outcomes, both physical and mental, are impaired in patients with MASLD. Impairment worsens with um, disease activity and severity, as well as the presence of comorbidities. The fatigue pro predicts poor patient well being and adverse clinical outcomes. An improvement of clinical endpoints should lead to an improvement of pro um, endpoints as well. So it's important to look at patient reported outcomes, both um, in the trial settings, but also when you're engaging um, with your clinicians. They're important measures um, for research and, and, and the trials themselves, which should always um, include them, but it's also important. Um, to be carrying this out um, outside the clinical trial um, setting so we can really understand what issues, physical and mental, are affecting our patients. Um, a, policy a global policy review held um, around a few, a few years ago found that while there's not surprisingly no MASLD or MASH strategies in countries, although India and the U.S. now have strategies, in where there should be mentions of MASLD MASH in strategies that are in place in countries around obesity, around diabetes, around healthy lifestyles, um, MASLD and MASH, or when we searched for NAFLD and NASH, are, are just not mentioned at all. So one of the things we need to do, one of the priority issues is to raise awareness in these comorbid conditions in these adjacent fields and make sure that they are mentioning liver disease and specifically MASLD and MASH and referring um, to our guidelines. So we can start the team approach in the multidisciplinary model of care from the pathology clinics, but it also needs to come um, from the conditions that are, that are the most common um, comorbidities. Many of you were involved in this global effort to set research priorities for steatotic liver disease. This is the first effort really filling in a gap uh, for what the World Health Organization should be doing and following the priority domain set in the public health um, consensus statement from a few years ago, focusing on human and economic burden, models of care, patient and community perspectives, education and awareness, treatment and care, and leadership policies. I won't go through all of these obviously, but a set of priorities both for research and for action were set at the global level to guide the field as we move forward and move forward with the nomenclature. Similarly, here are the action priorities so that we need research, but we also need concrete actions. Well, it might be obvious that we need this in treatment and care and, and, and prevalence, human economic burden and, and, and models of care. We also need it in these other areas, how to engage with patients better um, how to engage um, with health authorities and really look at the governance, um, the health systems and health global health governance that impacts um, our ability to respond. All of that means we need to expand the steatotic liver disease community of practice. It's very, very small now. It's largely in the upper left around hepatology and gastroenterology, but we need to be thinking about public health. Um, a range of associated non-governmental organizations and community-based organizations. How do we engage the community better? How do we engage industry, not just pharmaceutical and diagnostics, but also med tech and digital health? And how do we engage the broader global health community? You can go to the World Health Organization meetings, to the UN meetings related to health, and you will never hear a mention of MASLD and MASH, and that really needs to change, and we started to make that change at a side event of the World Health Assembly. This is the highest governing body of the World Health Organization, and in May at the ESO headquarters, but with representation from all of the leading organizations, you see them listed here on the right. Um, we spoke to WHO experts, the head of the uh, unit on non-communicable diseases and others, together with several ministers of health from Brazil, from Egypt, and policy leaders, to talk about our vision to end steatotic liver disease as a global public health threat and how to mobilize the needed action um, to carry uh, this out. So where do we go from here? 
We have a strong body of work from which to build. We have the new nomenclature. So now is the time to accelerate our efforts. The growing burden around the world requires policy changes that address not only social determinants, but also structural and commercial determinants, along with the primary, secondary prevention, treatment, and care that we're all familiar with. And to do that, we'll need to grow the community to engage the policymakers, policy influencers, and patients as stewards of change. We need to be thinking globally to get a common and unified voice to raise awareness and action on steatotic liver disease. So that's growing the community of practice and bringing a united voice um, to global conversations. One effort to do that is the Healthy Livers, Healthy Lives collaboration that brings together ASLD, Easel, Apostle, and Ale. Um, to stand united to address steatotic liver disease. And I'll just conclude by acknowledging so many people from around the world, almost 500 people who have engaged um, in this process to develop research and action priorities to change the nomenclature and to really get this um, on the agenda as a public health threat so that, can, so that it can be addressed at the highest levels. Thank you. With that, I'll pass over to you. Um, Dr. Arab to address alcohol and related issues. Thank you, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Jeff and Maru for the great talks. Now I have the task to try to provide some insight on the, this uh, overlap or uh, what happened with uh, uh, the intersection between MASLD and ALD, what's the role of, uh, a, um, of this new entity, MET-ALD. So we are going to discuss difference and overlapping between these uh, two different entities. Uh, we are going to dive a little bit on the mechanics of uh, liver injury, MET-ALD. And most importantly, um, I don't know if I have many answers for you, but I have many questions. And we are going to try to uh, recognize the importance on distinguishing uh, the phenotypes and uh, for what we should do from a clinical perspective, but also uh, from a research standpoint. So if you look like the potential years of uh, working life loss uh, by causes of liver disease, you can see very clearly in the graph that the two most important ones are alcohol and also obesity. So we can do a parallel that the ALD and muscle D are probably taking the main fraction of, uh, uh, of um, morbidity and mortality associated with liver disease. And this is not trivial. And then alcohol consumption is also very common. And this is just for the Americas. And the Americas ranks second just following the European region. Uh, alcohol consumption worldwide is very common. So 43% of the population worldwide consume alcohol. It's more than 60% in the, in the Americas. And uh, so, for example, the US is a uh, 9.8 liters of uh, pure alcohol per capita per year. So alcohol consumption is common as well as obesity. And uh, this is, for example, coming from the trends on liver transplantation. You can see how in both male and females, the two most common causes are not only the most common, they are rising, is ALD and uh, MASH. So this is a problem that is already very common, is prevalent, and the uh, Prevalence is increasing, so it's going to be even more important in the upcoming years. So Dr. Rinell already told you about the new definition and how we have this patient with metabolic dysfunction, which is muscle D. We have the patients with the ALD. But then what happened with the patients that are in between? These patients with the overlap between uh, muscle D, those patients that, that has some features of metabolic dysfunction, but also they are drinking more than what is considered low drinking, uh, uh, how uh, alcohol and the metabolic dysfunction interact in this population. And potentially they have a, a different natural history with a, a, a quicker progression and they developing more complications. So if we look like in the uh, pathophysiology of, uh, of MET-ALD, um, we will know that both, like both muscle D and at what point with the insulin resistance and the metabolic dysfunction will induce lipolysis with an uh, increased influx of free fatty acid to the livers, uh, but also alcohol also produce lipolysis. So it's also going to increase the, the uh, uptake of free fatty acids by the liver. 
both diet, like unhealthy diet, but also alcohol will produce this biosis and also probably some bacterial translocation. And those bacteria and bacterial probes are going to go through the portal vein back to the liver to generate again more inflammation, recruiting of inflammatory cells. Um, free fatty acid, but also alcohol products, in particular acetaldehyde, will produce increase of the oxygen reactive uh, species, generating oxidative stress and autophagy, and then you know, in general producing more apoptosis and, and liver damage. So there is some common pathways that are seen in both uh, ALD and also muscle D and probably the interaction of both is generating more disease. A very clear example is what happened with the, uh, for example, the polymorphism for PNAPL3. So this increased the risk of progression of the disease in muscle D and also in ALD, increasing both the risk of fibrosis, disease progression, and also hepatocellular carcinoma. So probably there are some common pathways. So what are the future directions? And here I want to kind of give a, a more deep dive on, on, on some questions. So in patient care, what is safe threshold of alcohol consumption in individuals with muscle D? We know that from a general population on the, these two Lancet papers, that the, uh, the, the, probably the amount for no risk is zero. And the, the amount of low risk is probably lower of what we thought before, especially in young population. Uh, for that reason, the, uh, in Canada, uh, we reduced the uh, recommendation of low risk drinking to two drinks per week. It used to be seven drinks per week. Now it's two drinks per week. And seven drinks per week, indeed, if you drink more than that, is considered high risk. So again, I think we need uh, more data, in particular in this population, in how is the low drinking. What happened with the natural history of met ALD? How light, moderate, or harmful, uh, harmful alcohol consumption will influence the outcome of muscle D? We know that uh, there is a spectrum from the normal liver, then steatosis, MASH, and then cirrhosis. This is for muscle D, and it's a very similar spectrum for ALD with the difference of the alcohol-associated hepatitis in between. But we know that in the long term, and this is uh, true for uh, ALD, but uh, it may be for MET-ALD, is that at the end, in the long term, the most important uh, uh, predictors of prognosis are the fibrosis stage, of the, if the patient has fibrosis or no, and which degree, and the level of alcohol consumption of, or if the patient is able to achieve abstinence. And um, this is a very nice recent uh, review paper uh, that showed that, you know, if you have muscle D, met ALD, or ALD, your risk of decompensation will depend on, of course, the level of alcohol consumption increasing here and also the degree of fibrosis. And you can see how if you have five kilopascal and muscle D, you are five risk, uh, five year risk of developing a, um, the compensation of liver disease is less than 1%. But if you have ALD, that risk is 2 to 15%, and with fibrosis, it's a, a 15 to 50%. So it's, it's clear that alcohol is contributing to uh, the uh, progression of liver disease, and the speed of progression of the liver disease is much accelerated. What happened with the interaction of alcohol and metabolic dysfunction? Again, this is uh, it's a good question because alcohol itself produced some changes uh, first, in the liver, that are very similar to what happened with muscle D, where you have the uh, insulin resistant diabetes, but the alcohol intake is also uh, generating this impaired lipid handling and uh, leading to more inflammation within the liver. It's the same that happened with uh, uh, the ethanol, and it may be even the same in this uh, microbiota producing alcohol in patients with NAFLD. So I think there are more things that we need to know. And the other thing that is important to clarify is that alcohol not only affects the liver, indeed affects multiple organs. And we know that even alcohol itself can produce hypertension, increased triglycerides, and produce other problems that it may are, are part also of the metabolic syndrome or metabolic dysfunction. Another problem that we have is that we don't have specific biomarkers to address met ALD, to get diagnosis and treatment. There are some effort, for example, here, 
using extracellular vessel goals as biomarkers for alcohol. Uh, there are some similar efforts to do to NASH. So I think we need new uh, uh, diagnosis and prognostic non-invasive biomarkers for the disease. And then what's the clinical role of some of the genetic polymorphisms? I show you how PNLPL3 uh, uh, has a role in both, in muscle and alcohol. What happened with the other polymorphisms that has been described in muscle Are those applicable in uh, ALD? Are those applicable in met ALD? I think those are some of the things that we will need to clarify. And finally, we need some consensus on which are the best public health policies to address MET-ALD. And this should be some of the policies that we are currently uh, implementing for alcohol. But again, as uh, Jeff was mentioning, this needs to be a so society approach where uh, we need to incorporate all the healthy lifestyle that is promoted for cardiovascular health, for diabetes, for stroke prevention, also in, in these policies. What happened with, uh, from the clinical research or, the, or therapeutic trials standpoint in met ALD, one big problem is the under-reporting of alcohol in patients with muscle D. So how we should consider this for clinical trials. One of the things that even from a uh, clinical practice perspective, probably we are not doing great, is using uh, a score to identify patients with alcohol use disorder how the alcohol use disorder plays a role here. It's not only the amount of alcohol that the patient is drinking, is the pattern, and also is the psychiatric comorbidity that needs to be assessed. We have the audit score that is 10 questions. There is a short version that is only three questions and um, should help as a screening tool in all hepatology consults. Every time that we are seeing one patient with muscle D or met ALD, not only ALD, we should be screening for alcohol use disorder. We need also more data on uh, uh, how useful are to use uh, the alcohol intake biomarkers in patients with met ALD. And this is a very interesting study coming from Austria, published last year, where they took patients with the old definition of NAFLD. So these patients were supposed to not be drinking alcohol. They did a uh, alcohol biomarker in hair, ethyl glucuronide, and they found that almost 30% of these patients uh, uh, um, were in the category of uh, at least moderate to excessive alcohol consumption. So uh, alcohol is for sure under report, it's stigmatized, and many of the patients that we believe that is only metabolic dysfunction, probably alcohol is playing a role, and there is where having uh, good tools for met ALD and implementing uh, counseling at both on the alcohol side and also the lifestyle, diet, and exercise side is very important for these patients. So we need to also test that some of the uh, drug that has been developed for muscle D, what happened in the met ALD population. So there is a huge pipeline of drugs being tasted in muscle D. What happened in the met ALD population? Are they useful? Are they make sense to, uh, according to the mechanism of action, to be used in patients with met ALD? Those are the things that uh, we will need to know. But from a clinical standpoint, I will say that every time that we are assessing a patient with a steatotic liver disease, and this is probably one of the uh, big step forward of the new uh, definition, is we have this umbrella term and we recognize that there are two main entities that are driving uh, uh, disease most likely in this patient. One is the metabolic dysfunction, one is ALD, but they are not exclusive. So the, you can have both, you can have this dual etiology, which is met ALD, and we need to make brief intervention, counseling, motivational interview for both lifestyle changes and alcohol consumption. So as a summary, uh, muscle D and uh, ALD are leading cause of uh, chronic liver disease worldwide. They are frequently overlapped. This new definition of MET-ALD is, is probably a, a big step forward in the field, but we need more uh, data, especially how we deal with the underreport alcohol consumption, how we use biomarkers. Healthy diet and physical activity should be encouraged to all the patients, even ALD patients, same as alcohol abstinence in patients with muscle D. And 
And then future research, those are kind of the main questions that we discuss, clinical course, biomarkers, and then the efficacy of these uh, new therapies. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Juan Pablo. And uh, thank you for three outstanding uh, presentations, uh, Maru, Jeff. Uh, really enjoyed your presentations. And it's, it's my pleasure now to uh, kick this Q&A off. And we have two uh, questions in the chat. Feel free to answer more, uh, to um, enter more and, and we'll be answering um, as we go along. I'd like to start with a very quick question for you, Maru, um, and then we'll take more. Um, how do you do it practically? I mean, we had a lot of discussions um, about the new nomenclature. When you speak to your patients, um, what is your perceived response uh, from them? Can you give some insight? Yeah, I actually think that many patients really like it because instead of saying, well, you've got, you know, fat in the liver, but it's not from alcohol, you know, I sort of start off by saying that, you know, that they have a disease where their metabolism isn't working properly and due to either accumulation of, of fat inside the abdominal cavity or problems with the way they manage glucose and insulin, um, they have a predisposition to put fat in the liver and that causes X, Y, and Z problems. So I, I give them sort of a little bit more on, on the why. And I think it it's, I think patients, is, I mean, they so far they've liked it uh, and it makes sense to them. Great, thanks. There's a question in the chat. I'm gonna pass that to you, Juan uh, Pablo, um, by Dr. Duseja um, around heavy alcohol use and metabolic dysfunction. Um, you very nicely detailed some of the additional uh, overlaps in the mechanisms uh, with increasing alcohol intake. Um, when is the prognosis driven by one or the other? Uh, do you think there is a clear response? Yeah, I think at the end, you know, the, the name is more uh, um, division for us to do research and have uh, a good idea of what we are talking about. Um, if it's going to be meta ALD or ALD with metabolic dysfunction, I think the concept is understanding that uh, this patient will have a different prognosis than patients that are pure metabolic dysfunction or pure ALD. Uh, of course, the progression, as I show you, of this uh, uh, recent Lancet GI paper, uh, the, pr the prognosis when you have alcohol in uh, the scheme is worse and means that the progression is faster. Uh, so we need to recognize that and probably counsel the patient on both things. We uh, sometimes not not uh, very infrequently we are seeing a patient with ALD and we forget about all the uh, cardiovascular or metabolic dysfunction uh, um, ad advice. Uh, for example, we don't prescribe a statin to those patients, and probably those are things that we need to start focusing. Same when we have a patient with muscle D and they are drinking alcohol. Uh, we should be more active on recommending not drinking alcohol. Um, I think we need more data to uh, dissect the specific contribution of each um, risk factor for metabolic dysfunction and um, for each um, kind of amount of alcohol in this population. But I, I think that's probably the main step forward of the definition. Right. Naeem, um, did you want to chime in? Uh, yeah, I have a question for each of you guys, if you don't mind. Uh, I'll start with uh, my good friend, Dr. Lazarus, who, by the way, just won the uh, Distinguished Scientific Achievement Award by the American Liver Foundation. So congratulations, my friend. Um, you actually mentioned uh, the concept of social prescribing, and that was fascinating to me. And you mentioned it's been done in other fields. I was wondering if you can share some like outcomes data in HIV or diabetes. Uh, very interesting idea. Yeah, thank you. So, so it's new for this field. It's been discussed quite a bit, and at the level of the of the UK government, Nice and others there, they have talked about you know should this be a formal you know policy. Um, there is some some mixed data. There's a lot of confounding. There's a, these studies are, are hard to carry out, um, but we but there is data certainly from 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 HIV um, that when when the prescription includes more than just take the meds, but brings in um, connections to peer groups, provide sometimes pamphlets are provided um, in the Basque country in Spain, for example. 
um, prescribing uh, and care for HIV is closely linked to social welfare. So when we start to link up and have joined up services, there are there are better better outcomes shown than let's say a standalone or the standard of care, which is just straight up um, treatment prescription. And JP, to follow up, as you said, you know, your presentation, many questions, uh, many things for us to think about. Uh, but quickly, uh, in terms of biomarkers, we know alcohol affects, you know, the biomarkers we use for muscles like FIB4, the effect on AST, potentially on liver stiffness. What does it take for us to actually validate the same algorithms in the MET-ALD? Uh, do we have to validate all over again against biopsies? Uh, how do you see us doing this? So yeah, those are uh, I think great questions, and they, they, one of the big problem is is uh, for example the only study that compared like in the more ALD population indeed showed that forms is the best non-invasive score. It's even better than fit form, although they are pretty similar. I would say that uh, the problem that we have with the other non-invasive biomarkers such as uh, or, or techniques such as elastography is the role of inflammation. So how we um, assess um, a fibro scan. They are Christoph Moreno from Belgium. He kind of tried to correct the uh, fibro scan kilopascals, but AST. So trying to model. I would say that it's a, it's uh, it would be ideal if we can validate these things against biopsy. But if not, probably what we will need to do is to uh, have a cohort where we have. Uh, these biomarkers and see what are the outcomes and how they progress. Um, but I agree that one of the big roles in the field will be biomarkers, not only for fibrosis, biomarkers for inflammation, biomarkers of alcohol consumption in the met ALD population. I agree, uh, JP. And just to address one of the questions in the chat, Dr. Arisi asks about alcohol biomarkers. Uh, and again, I think in my clinic, I have ethanol glucuronide available, but I know the in the US, you use the PET test more extensively. Uh, JP, do you want to share something on that? So yeah, so there is a couple of uh, alcohol uh, biomarkers. Uh, um, the most common one is ethyl glucuronide and ethyl sulfate. Those are done normally in urine. They can um, give you an idea of uh, uh, heavy alcohol consumption three up to five days before. So it's uh, not long term. The problem is urine. So we don't always have urine in this patient and maybe some false positives. Um, so that's the probably most widely available. You can do it in here, like the study from Austria, but it's not very commonly used and it's more expensive. And the second one that is probably the most commonly used in the US is a phosphatidyl ethanol, so PET. The advantage of PET is uh, it's done in blood, so it's whole blood sample. You don't need the urine. It's able to uh, catch heavy alcohol consumption three weeks before, up to one month. Uh, and uh, and it's, uh, the, the um, uh, positive predictive value is almost 100%, so it does not have false positives. So I will say that those are both um, good options depending on what you have. And I think in the future, probably we should um, start working on uh, implementing biomarkers, for example, for clinical trials, how we uh, select these patients. And for patient care, for me, more than kind of uh, telling the patient that he's guilty that he's drinking, how we tailor our interventions. So it's only pharmacotherapy for AUD, we need to send for behavioral therapy, how often we need to follow, and all those things. Thanks, JP. Naeem, I think we're at the bottom of the hour. Um, I'd like to thank um, the faculty, um, the, uh, the um, staff from ASLD who's been supporting us in the back end here. Uh, of course, uh, the faculty also for answering live the questions. I think everything went through smoothly. Thank you, all of you. Wishing you a wonderful evening, and I'll hand it over to you, Naeem, for last words, maybe. Uh, thank you so much, Jorn, and thank you for all the panelists and uh, also my co-moderators, and uh, we hope to see you soon at another ASLD webinar.